Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. Part 1 You are going to hear a news broadcast about proposed developments in a local area and about a local college. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and decide which four planned developments are mentioned. And now for our main headlines on Southern Local News for today. First of all, the report relating to the proposed motorway and other developments around the village of Tartlesbury was published this morning. And, as has been expected, it has created quite a lot of interest. The new motorway will pass along the north side of the village, crossing the River Team less than half a kilometre from the well-known beauty spot, Streve Ford, to the northeast of the village. The motorway will cut the village off from the ford, where many children play. But that is not the end of it. There are also plans to build a thousand houses on farmland west of the village. And on top of that, there are proposals to build an industrial estate for new technology companies on the site of the old steelworks on the edge of the village. A new centre with a swimming pool and a very wide range of sports facilities and a large supermarket with other shops are also planned next to the housing estate. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Mr Jones, a local farmer we spoke to early today, is strongly against the plans. But the local council is pushing for them to be adopted in full. They say that new housing is needed in the area and that it is an opportunity to take advantage of government grants for setting up new technology developments. The mayor, Mr Fun, says, We must make every effort to do our part for the economy of the country and for the local people. This is a golden opportunity to put Tartlesbury on the map. Reactions to Mr Fun's comments have been quick to come. Surprisingly, when we contacted the spokesman of the local conservation group, he was very much for the planned developments. But not all the local groups support the scheme. And, unlike the mayor, the local MP, Mrs Wright, is very much against the planned developments. Mr Khan, a local shopkeeper, had this to say. People are absolutely horrified at what is being proposed here. This is just a chance for some people to make money quickly. But I can assure you that if they think that local people are going to be a walkover, they have another think coming. Of course... We welcome the jobs that the new technology park will bring, but we feel that the large increase in housing and the proposed motorway will destroy the character of the area. I think this is a debate that is going to run on for quite some time, and we here on Local News will keep you informed. And now for something quite different. This year's exam results have just come out, and there are a lot of happy faces out there. It would seem that the number of young people going on to university from the local college in Upton, which is not far from Tartlesbury, has increased by 25% this year. All those who have applied to go to university or into teacher training colleges have found places. This is the first time that there has been a 100% success rate at the college. We spoke earlier to the principal of the college, who said she was very proud of all those who had achieved their aims 
and she wished them every success in the future. There will be another news bulletin at 11 pm. And for now, it's back to more music from around the world. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks, and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV. A lot of people complain that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that, although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programs as role models and copy their behaviour. So, what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programs should be broadcast after 10pm, when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people who feel that violent films should be banned altogether. Or well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable, as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out 120 and I got 70 back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student in my hall of residence and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? 
the people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions. Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So, how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There, it's better to write a lot of short specific questions than longer general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write. Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. We we'll hear a discussion between a tutor, Dr. Lester, and two students, Greg and Alexandra, at the end of a talk about music. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about some of the students' favorite instruments and favorite styles of music. Complete the table showing the students' opinions. Choose your answers from the box. There are more words than spaces, so you will not use them all. You may use any of the words more than once. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. I think it's time we looked at the results of our survey. Uh, what did you find out, Alexandra? We're a group with very diverse tastes, Dr Lester. Mm, I'm not surprised. What were the favourite instruments? Well, Greg loves drums. He told me he played drums when he was at primary school and now he plays drums with his friends at weekends. They have a band. Hmm, good. Uh, what do you like to play, Alexandra? My favourite is the guitar. However, I haven't played for years, so I keep hoping to start again. Will I go on with the others? Hmm, yes, please. Katya is like Greg. She loves to listen to drums. She says she's not a player, just a listener. Rachel, as you know, is a violinist, so of course it's natural that she should favour the violin. So we have two people who love the sound of the drum and two who like strings. Uh, the violin for Rachel and the guitar for Alex. What does Harry like? Harry says the best instrument of them all is the piano. He claims it's more versatile than any other instrument. Emiko plays the piano, but her favourite instrument is the flute. The flute? Yes, Emiko plays the flute too, of course. Hmm. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, Greg, will you tell us the students' favourite style of music? We're really very conservative. My favourite is classical music, and that's Alexandra's choice too. Katja claims to like rock. So that's a vote from Greg, Alexandra and Katja. Uh, doesn't Rachel prefer classical music? Rachel made a choice which surprised me. She plays the violin, so I expected classical or opera but Rachel says that she prefers country music. Mm, how interesting. What's Harry's choice? Harry likes to listen to opera and loves to go to see a performance. 
He says opera has everything, colour and spectacle and theatre and great music. And Emiko? Emiko says jazz is her favourite music. She goes to listen to jazz every Friday evening. She also likes opera, heavy metal, classical, but jazz is the best. Thank you, Greg. I wanted to see what you all liked so I could understand your musical tastes more. And I want to move from this to a discussion of the physiological effects of music. In the second part of the discussion, Dr Lester will talk about the way music affects our bodies. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. For the purposes of uh, this discussion, I'm going to divide music roughly into two types, music which stimulates us and music which calms us. It seems that music which stimulates us gives rise to actual changes in our bodies. We listen to exciting music and our hearts beat faster, our blood pressure rises and our blood flows more quickly. In short, we're stimulated. Soothing music, however, has the opposite effect. We relax and let the world go by. Our heart beats more gently, our blood pressure drops, and we feel calm. Um, Alexandra, can you think of things which help us to relax? Um, gentle rhythms? Yes, in part. The melodies which help us to relax are smooth flowing and often have repeated rhythms. These rhythms are constant and dynamic a little like the crash of the sea on the beach. Their very predictability is sedating, relaxing. By contrast, very loud, discordant music with unpredictable rhythms and structures excites and stimulates us. These two generalizations about the differences between music which stimulates and music which soothes are true as far as they go, but they are far from conclusive. We still have a lot of research to do to find out what, uh, for instance, people of different cultures hear and feel when they listen to music. This department is taking part in a continuing study on the influence of culture on musical perception, and we'll talk about that more next week. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. In this section, you'll hear an interview on IQ tests. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Mrs. Kellerman, a specialist in child psychology, is interviewed by Bridget. Mrs. Kellerman, why is it that some children perform much better than others at school? Obviously, it can't be denied that certain children are brighter than others, but it's not as simple as that. A lot of emphasis is placed on intelligence measured by tests, so-called IQ tests, 
which only measure certain types of intelligence, such as basically linguistic and numerical skills, or reading and mathematics, to put it plainly, which is unfortunate because some children are bound to suffer. A good example was a friend of mine's son who was kept out of the top class at school because of his average IQ. That's around one hundred. His father, though he had no idea his son was going to be an architect, always said he was a clever child. Apparently, he was able to picture things in his mind and draw accurately at a very early age. The point is that his university life might not have been so difficult if his ability had been recognized sooner. What you're saying then is that some children have abilities that are not easy to measure. That aren't appreciated by many schools, precisely. And if these schools are not spotted sufficiently early, they cannot be developed. That's why, in my view, there are so many unhappy adults in the world. They are not doing the things they are best at. What are those other kinds of intelligence? How can we recognize them in our children? Well, take musical talent. Many children never get the chance to learn to play an instrument, but while they might not become great artists or composers, they may get a lot of pleasure and satisfaction. Musically gifted children are fascinated by all kinds of sounds, car horns, animal noises, and so on, and they can easily recognize tunes and sing them in key. How can a parent encourage them? Sing to them and teach them new songs. Buy a piano, or even a cheap instrument such as a recorder. If you can afford it, send them to music lessons as soon as possible. Play recordings of different instruments to them. What about a child who is good at sport? Could that be described as a form of intelligence? Most certainly, we psychologists call it motor or bodily intelligence. These children move gracefully and handle objects skillfully. A child who finds it easy to take things apart and use various tools may well become an engineer with the right encouragement. We should give them models to make and take them to science museums. However, unless these children are also good with words and numbers, they will probably not do well in school examinations. Is there anything a parent can do to help in this case? Yes, it may be worth spending money on private lessons, but you know, hardly anyone is good at everything. In my opinion, a child should be judged on his individual talents. After all, being happy in life is putting your skills to good use, no matter what they are. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.